Norman Zinberg was an eminent psychiatrist, Harvard Medical School professor, drug abuse treatment expert, public advocate of drug policy reform, and world-renowned author. His 1984 book, Drug, Set, and Setting, was a landmark publication that documented the powerful role of set and setting that's now widely accepted in shaping individual drug use. To present this year's Norman E. Zinberg Award for Achievement in the Field of Medicine, please welcome DPA's Managing Director for Development, Ellen Flanagan. It's my great honor this evening to pay tribute to a hero, the late Dr. Jack Fishman. Dr. Fishman was born in 1930 and was forced as a child to flee Nazi-occupied Poland with his family, finding refuge in Shanghai and later immigrating to the United States. Dr. Fishman pioneered the study of opiate antagonists and developed a number of medicinal compounds that aid in reversing the effects of opioids, the most prominent of these being naloxone. As you all obviously know, the life-saving medicine now widely used throughout the United States and many countries around the world. His legacy is truly a miracle for our community and has prevented hundreds of thousands of people from dying of an opioid overdose. More than 40 years after inventing naloxone, Dr. Fishman lost his own stepson, Jonathan Stampler, to a heroin overdose. Jonathan's mother, Joy, told the Huffington Post, quote, it never even occurred to us that naloxone could save Jonathan. Back then, we didn't think of naloxone as a household item. Doctors weren't writing take-home pre prescriptions for it. It was hard for Jack to get naloxone, even though he invented it. Somehow, emerging from this immense sorrow, Joy found the strength to become a fearless advocate, carrying forth the legacies of both her husband and her son, fighting for greater access to naloxone and syringes fighting, just as her husband had, to breathe new life into our loved ones. So tonight, I pay tribute to another hero, Joy Fishman, who will be accepting this award on her husband's behalf. Joy, as I present this award to you, I also make a sincere promise. We will stand alongside you in this struggle, fighting to increase access to your husband's miracle drug, fighting to prevent mothers from suffering the same pain you have. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Jack. Everyone said, what are you going to say, Joy? And I said, I, I only have one word. It's naloxone. What else is there to say? And I'm not a fearless person. I am a product of Ethan Nadelman. <laughs> when my son died, I had opted to go underground and do my grieving. and. Uh, Ethan somehow years later tracked me down and he said, you have a story to tell. You can't just go quietly in the night. You have to tell your story. The story is one of irony. My husband invented naloxone. My son, Jonathan, died of a heroin overdose. Something that my dear Jack, my husband, suffered in agony over for years to come because he knew that it was a possibility that this could have saved Jonathan. But what happened? And the question is not what happened, the question is what didn't happen. Jonathan died of an overdose and he was dumped, literally, and you've all heard these stories before, in Hialeah. 
There was no naloxone. There were no harm reduction people working to save his life. There was no Good Samaritan law. So the people that dumped him did not call 911 for fear of being arrested themselves. So there is the story, and there is the sadness. But here is the upside. My son, his beautiful girlfriend, Ashley, who also died of an overdose, I'm here as a spiritual mother to them and a spiritual wife to my husband, and I'm here to say thank you for taking my husband's work and making it possible to save the lives that we've all saved. And Jack, I love you, I love you still, and I thank you for giving me this opportunity to give back. So thank you all. You may not be fearless, Joy, but you are brave. Thank you. Robert C. Randall was a pioneer on the issue of medical marijuana in the United States. He was a model citizen who took on the federal government and assisted defending people accused of criminal offenses involving marijuana. The Robert C. Randall Award for Achievement in the Field of Citizen Action honor citizens who make democracy work in the difficult area of drug law and policy reform. To present this year's Robert C. Randall Award for Achievement in the Field of Citizen Action, please welcome DPA Senior Director for Grants, Partnerships, and Special Projects, Asha Bandeli. the last time I'm going to talk to you all today, and so I wanted to try to make it mean something. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you um, uh, part of the final conversation I had with one of my mentors, Dr. Maya Angelou, who died in May of 2014, and a week before her death, uh, I had a final conversation with her. And what she said is, you know, something she'd said publicly, but, you know, Dr. Maya liked to lecture a lot. And she said, of all the virtues that one can possess, most important of all is the virtue of courage. That sense of courage is what binds the two people who we are here to honor tonight for the Robert C. Randall Award. We hear people speak on panels a lot, but probably don't give a lot of thought to what it means, about what it means to lay your soul bare, for the world to judge, reject, or honor. You never know what it's gonna be, and it can be any one of all the three. Pastor Kenneth Glasgow and Kathy Kane Willis embody the idea of courage. These two people who I have worked with every day, whether I wanted to or not, since 2005, have exemplified a level of courage that I just want to take you through. And I'll share this with you. With my husband in jail, there came a point where I could no longer walk into prisons. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. I didn't realize it. But it was later actually diagnosed. And to think that Kenny, after being in hell, the people who would have seen you dead, that you walked back in those prisons, not once and not a hundred times, but hundreds of times, to ensure that hundreds of thousands of people would have the right to vote from inside the prison, from inside the prison, in one state, is monumental to me, and not just that. When prisoners went on strike throughout the state of Georgia, 
and no one was paying attention to them around the exploitation of prison labor and the violence because trust me, what we see on our screens in the street that they do to our children walking home with Skittles and, and, and iced tea in their hand, they have practiced behind walls without cameras on people in prison and to know you walked back into that, my love, is beyond my own comprehension and Kathy, I could talk about what you did in Chicago. I could talk about how we first met on a racial justice platform trying to change the laws in a city that was up south. I could talk about how you made naloxone accessible to people who went unconsidered. I could talk about how you ensured methadone maintenance. But I'm gonna tell people, because I know and I remember and we had late night conversations when you came out about your own personal history with drugs in a research organization and you didn't know how they would see you. You didn't have a PhD. You had no protection and you were somebody's mother. Courage. And finally, what it is going to take to ensure our movement. Because we talk a lot about strategy. We talk a lot about being super smart. We talk a lot about logic models. But love is not a logic model. Love is something you carry within you. Love is something you know, and it takes courage to love deeply. It takes courage to love people who sometimes are hard to love, who sometimes are difficult to love. This is what binds you together. This is why you are our proud partners, and this is why both of you, Kathy Kane Willis and Castor Kenneth Glasgow, both of you deserve the Robert C. Randall Award for Action in Citizen Democracy because you make our world better. You change our culture. Please join me on the stage. So we're going to let beauty before age. Go ahead, <laughs> Kathy. No disrespect. No disrespect. I cannot begin to express, I'm also height challenged, aside from challenged in many other ways, how much this honor means to me personally. But no one single person is responsible for acts of advocacy. This award is for those people who inspired me and worked alongside me. This were, award is for Asha, right. who believed in me right. when maybe people didn't. That's right. And Ethan, who actually believed in me when other people didn't. And Jenny Janitek, who probably no one knows, but <laughs> she helped co-found the Illinois Consortium on Drug Policy with me. And to all the SSGPers out there who work so goddamn tirelessly, and Bill Marie, this is for you. Stephanie Schmitz Beckler, this award is especially for you. You did so much of the work, so much behind the scenes while I stood in the spotlight. For all of those of you who stood in the spotlight but put your backs into the work, this is for you. Working alongside people who have been personally impacted by overdose and advocating for overdose prevention and criminal justice reform, civil rights, and against racial disparities has taught me so much. So many people who have worked through pain and dignity, yet with so much grace. People like Tammy Alt, who have personally dealt with overdose and still managed to make change. People like Kathy Arbini, a parent who lost her child, but when we're working on Missouri's overdose prevention law said, my boy would be so proud of me. He would be so proud. This community of people has taught me so much. How to live through prison, how to deal with injustice, so much of how to deal with my own struggles, my living with cancer. So I thank them all for this award. 
I've also been thinking, because I think too much, <laughs> about what it means to recover. I was once asked as a part of a government survey, survey, as part of redefining recovery, what was recovery? To me, recovery is not about drugs or alcohol, it's about living a fully realized life, yeah. right? Uh, it's a fully realized life with work, with connections to people you love and learning and growing. It's a process. And then I started to think about this more. We all, all of us, whether or not we've ever had a substance use disorder, are in recovery. We are in recovery from life. Life can be so tough, and we are all working to learn and grow and balance ourselves so that we are living the best lives we can. And honestly, this health struggle, this work has taught me something else. It's not enough to be courageous and an advocate and fight against injustice. One must also be in recovery from life, too. Learning to balance mind and work and body and spirit and rest and play and family and friends is probably the hardest lesson I've had to learn, especially, especially for advocates, especially for you. So to all of those advocates out there, I wish you recovery. To everyone out there in recovery, whether from substance use disorder or from life, I say thank you. This award is for you. I don't know, man. Like, you gonna put me behind Kathy? Kathy took most of what I wanted to say. <laughs> but I will say this: I'm very, very grateful to receive this award, and um, on behalf of the people that deserve it, that's sitting over there that y'all don't never see. My mother, who believed in me and took two hundred dollars to get me out, even after I did fourteen years in prison. Some of y'all don't realize they sent us home from prison back to county jails and city jails because we still got tickets we didn't pay, fines we had left over. And for some reason, while we're in prison, they just don't seem to act like we paying those fines at the same time and had to pawn in our car. So, Ma, this for you. And this for all of my children. This for you, TT. And your grandmother that believed in me enough to try to make me the man of the year. When folks asked her, was she crazy? Because I'm an ex-crackhead, and I'm an ex-felon, I'm an ex-this. Well, I'm an ex a whole bunch of other stuff too they don't know nothing about. <laughs> but for the record, we gonna leave that one alone, amen? But this right here for you too, Stephanie. And I couldn't pay the light bills and couldn't get Asha on the phone. And Asha had to fight with the board. And Ethan was just gracious enough to say, hey, we're going to keep them going. And for the last 11 years, we lived off of 30000 or either $40,000 if we were lucky because of DPA that believed that something could happen in the South regardless of what everybody else said. Yeah. And it did. And it did. And here, 16, 17 years later, Ethan, we got 17 laws in, in Alabama passed. 15, some say 15, some papers say 13. They'll figure it out after a while. <laughs> we got three laws changed in Georgia. One in West Virginia, one in Florida. But all that's done by them people sitting at them tables that y'all don't never see. All that's done with Project South and Stephanie and all them. When Stephanie said, let's group together and make a southern movement because as the South goes, so goes the nation. So my question now, you know, when I started now, and Ethan to tell you the first plenary he put me on back in 2005 before I stood on the chairs in 2009. Shh, don't tell no funders. But anyway, and one of the things we had was restore. We started on this to restore 
us first. To heal us first. To connect us first. To dismantle racism amongst us. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying? First. To eradicate classism and any kind of other ism that will stop us from being together first. And then the first time I met the law enforcement officers against prohibition, I tripped the hell out. Because I'm trying to figure out that's an oxymoron that you got police that's sitting there helping us advocates fight against prohibition and they used to lock people up. And I was so scared of people like Neil Franklin, Ira Glasser. I said, I don't care what y'all say, he gonna pull out them handcuffs sooner or later. <laughs> but he didn't. He came down and stood with me. And those guys over there that's in that corner, they will sing Prodigal Child Project and made theme songs all of us or nothing. And theme songs of Prodigal Child Project and be with me every day. Those are the guys at this award for right there. That come up out of the prisons. <laughs> so my question is, Ethan, how do we connect? How do we continue this? And I don't know how you stepped down. I'm still trying to figure that out. You're some kind of man to birth something, put it into a face, to get it to transition like it is. Asha was even asked in the day, I need a good white man to put on the panel. I remember when there wasn't no black people here but me and Darcy. So you all can look at what done happened here and see just in our movement how we have transitioned. So now let's take it to another step. How do we continue to connect? Those that believe in God and go to church and believe in Jesus and believe in Islam and believe. How do we connect with people that don't believe in God at all? How do we continue to connect? How do we continue to connect with those that are in prisons, those that are out of prisons, without seeing each other differently and allowing them to say nonviolent and, 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 and violent crimes and separate this crime from that crime? How do we continue to connect? How do we continue to connect politically and socially and economically where there's equity all amongst us so that none of us are lacking and all of us are fighting with the same strength and the same power? How how do we continue to connect? How do we continue to connect with this southern movement? And thank God that y'all having it here in Atlanta, Sharon Raven, and all of them got together and said, look, we're not only going to let you come here and have your DPA conference, but we're going to make it, uh, we're going to decriminalize, decriminalize so you can smoke while you're here. How do we connect the Southern movement with the national movement? How do we connect it in such a way when we got new funders coming into the fray like, like Chloe and Michelle and William and all them that's changing the funding world so we no longer got to fit a criteria or fit some kind of skilled evolution that they have, but they really looking at the grassroots work and what we doing and none of us are judging each other anymore. How do we continue to connect? With that being said, what Alabama, Florida, and Georgia looks like in five years, it doesn't just matter to the South anymore. Now it matters to the nation. So as I ask the question, how do we connect, I also got to reflect on how much we have already connected. So I end with my words that I started with in 2005 in the first DPA conference I went to when me and Ethan were sitting up there trying to discuss how we bring all of you here. Somebody say restore. restore. Come on, y'all. Somebody say restore. restore. Somebody say restore. And until we restore everybody, we have not restored each other or ourselves. <laughs>